All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, so we had a little bit of a mention of synthetic benchmarks and they, that they are bad before. So I will try to uh, give a talk which advocates for synthetic benchmarks, or at least in certain um, contexts. Before that, just a little bit of add. We do have a two-year postdoc position. So if that kind of stuff I'm talking about is interesting to you or catching and mitigating of event loop concurrency issues, please get in touch. All right, so the submitted talk title is towards a synthetic benchmark to assess virtual machine startup, warm up, and cold code performance. I perhaps could have uh, changed it to generating a million lines of code benchmark with realistic behavior because that's what I want to do in the end. Um, I should also say all of that is essentially still vision. Um, I haven't gone very far with doing that. Um, we have a master student who is hopefully going to help me with that, but that's more of a vision than an actual working system. So and since it's about synthetic benchmarks and you probably have strong opinions about them, feel free to interrupt me, throw tomatoes at me um, or anything during the talk. Um, so we have a live talk, so let's use that. So what's the context here that I have in mind? There is that idea of building virtual machines for long running server applications. Um, but one thing that has changed over the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so is that we actually don't have all that much long running server applications, at least at a specific end of the spectrum when it comes to building really large systems, really large um, kind of code bases. So here, just one example that I picked from the jumpstart paper from the Facebook people on HHVM, they kind of tried to combat that problem as well. So they observe in their Facebook server farms where they're talking about typical Facebook web servers that they lose a lot of capacity. So essentially the first five minutes of um, starting up the new version of Facebook costs them almost 100% of the capacity. And then it takes uh, perhaps, I don't know, what is it? Uh, eight, nine minutes or so to get to 50%. And then only after 25%, uh, 25 minutes, they reach about 100% percent of capacity. So to put that in context, they actually tell us that they deploy every 75 minutes. So you now can imagine that from a 75 minute chunk, about 25 minutes um, every time you're not um, serving your, your page, your application at 100% efficiency. So for Facebook, um, they have 100 million lines of hack PHP, they say, um, that, that's really a huge problem. Not everybody has that many lines of code, but uh, for instance, Shopify, you heard Maxime talking about building a JIT for them. Um, they have about 3 million lines of code and they deploy perhaps even more rapidly than Facebook. So you see here numbers 30 to 40 times a day. Of course, that's probably aggregate statistics and there might be multiple applications and in reality, those numbers might be lower. But what we see here is the notion of a long running server application is really not what we would expect that it's running for days or weeks on end. So just another example here, uh, just another language. I looked up, uh, um, what is it? Instagram uh, has a million lines of code uh, of Python and they also deploy 30 to 40, 50 times a day. So huge uh, churn in those systems. So what could we do if we would have better cold code benchmarks? Well, one of the things, of course, is looking into reducing that gap, that the lost capacity. So Jumpstart, really cool paper, um, does some of that. But um, one of the key issues, especially if you have really large application code bases, is the difference between interpreted and compiled speed. So I really want to look into closing that gap between hot and cold code, especially if you build systems based on cool new um, meta compilation systems where you can build your little language as an interpreter and then reuse the virtual machine in the kind of a system like Graal and Truffle and R Python, the 100 or 10x overhead might more like a thousand x or so. So for those, it's really important that we can close the gap between cold and hot code performance. But even if we have state-of-the-art custom-built applications, sorry, virtual machines running our perhaps Facebook or Shopify or whatever, 
on these kind of scales where we have millions of lines of code, we have to improve memory usage, garbage collection, parser, compiler, IR performance, so kind of the intermediate language that we use. Um, profiling at that scale has huge overhead collecting that metadata. And we as researchers can really only look into these things if we actually have access to these benchmarks and try to improve them. And I think there is still a lot of work to be done. So the problem here is a lot of people argue that our applications are the best benchmarks. And of course, they are the best benchmarks, but they are proprietary. So we typically don't actually have access to them. And they change, as I saw, um, as we saw before, 30 to 50 times a day. And I think Maxime mentioned that as well. So it's a constantly moving target. Not ideal if you want to do research. Of course, they're also integrated in larger systems. They have a lot of dependencies in terms of libraries, any kind of software, hardware systems, possibly. Um, they are hard to set up, hard to use, hard to understand. Again, not great if you're a very small team of researchers, perhaps. And uh, because they're running integrated into the other systems around them, isolating any kind of performance effects that perhaps your research idea brings is, of course, also hard. So, even if they have the best benchmarks and measure exactly what you really care about, they are not ideal in a research context. So my proposal is, and it's not a new proposal, it's a pretty old one, let's generate benchmarks. Let's have synthetic benchmarks. Of course, you will argue synthetic benchmarks are famous for measuring stuff that doesn't matter. And yes, uh, that essentially is the key problem of synthetic benchmarks. And especially in the past, um, we saw that we kind of misguide um, what optimization heuristics should really be about. And a lot of people, especially in the JavaScript field, have been trying to move away from that. But um, also in the past, uh, we got actually a little bit of interesting research. Here I picked one paper, the return of synthetic benchmarks, where people went and try to synthesize the same behavior that they see in real applications by kind of generating benchmarks and having them exhibit that um, behavior. They looked at very low level metrics. So here I picked the examples of branch prediction. So that's a um, screenshot in the back. And then what do we have in the front? It's instructions per cycles. And in the, the paper, they were able to show that they could synthesize benchmarks that have very similar behavior. Another example, yeah. So I hope there is a chance uh, that synthesized benchmarks can be useful and measure actually useful things that allow us to optimize. So another example is ACDC, ACDC JS. That is uh, perhaps more high level. So in our context, we may care about garbage collection performance. So that's what here a couple of people from Salzburg and Google looked at. And they looked at real benchmarks or real applications. Real applications, I think they looked at uh, the 10 most widely used uh, website at that point in time. And they captured the, for instance, object sizes and behavior uh, from a management, memory management perspective, things like lifetimes and so on. And then they created ACDCJS to emulate all that. And they got pretty close to that behavior by having a nice synthetic system where they could tweak and adapt um, the behavior as um, they observe in real applications and then have a system they can understand and use for optimizing things. So again, I hope that's another example that shows that at least to some degree, we can be successfully using these kind of synthetic systems. So of course, there could be other strategies. And I just picked three um, papers here. Let's ignore the first paper title. It's about synthesizing benchmarks. But one key thing is that they actually go to GitHub and build a huge corpus of programs they use for benchmarking. Uh, Anger Bench, another one, um, also goes to GitHub and extracts uh, C benchmarks from there. And then we have AutoBench. So the first paper essentially goes um, and looks for OpenCL kernels. So that was their research interest. The problem here is it's really small thing. So 140 lines of code. And then they use that uh, to synthesize benchmarks with that um, at the same kind of size. But they extracted a huge corpus of these kind of benchmarks. Not something in the range of a uh, hundred lines, uh, sorry, a million lines of code or even a hundred million lines of code. Anger benchmark uh, 
um, already a bigger corpus. So here per program about 5,000 lines of code. And then again, they use that to generate uh, specific benchmarks for what they were interested in here, reduction of uh, native code size uh, that they generated in the compiler. Um, but again, it's again, smaller benchmark. So it's not in the range of million lines of dynamic language code that I would be interested in. Perhaps also interesting out of bench, they actually went and looked at trying to extract workloads that are in the code bases on, on GitHub. So they specifically looked at Java and Scala and they found unit test. They tried to use as benchmarks. And they, they found a couple of uh, promising ones. So I think that's probably a good idea if you want to have kind of test as something that's a classic cold code benchmark. And I believe, um, especially the ground people in the call probably know that in their systems, unit tests are one of the things um, that really could use optimization because they really stress that kind of cold code performance. I fear a little bit from the perspective of do we measure the right thing? Bench, uh, unit tests might be kind of too specific and not necessarily uh, representative to the workloads. They may also not simply be large enough in the end, um, not to trigger all the things because we are testing units and not the whole integration system. So um, yeah, what I want to do is essentially generate benchmarks uh, that are larger. And one approach here could of course be machine learning. And the first paper I mentioned, synthesizing benchmarks, kind of go into that direction. And they, say they do have some promising results. Um, I personally am a little bit skeptical because in the end, I do need to understand what the benchmark is doing. And especially when I grant, generate them, I kind of want to know what's exactly going on, what's happening in there so that I can understand what kind of heuristic to build for my virtual machine. So given that machine learning is typically something black boxy, um, doesn't seem um, to be the, the best approach here. So. How could we then go about to generate benchmarks? Well, let's look at the ingredients first that we need. I believe we need things like dynamic metrics and static metrics. So we need to look at things like call graphs, stack height, call site polymorphism, many kind of dynamic types that are flow types that are flowing around in the system. Of course, a dynamic instruction mix on some kind of abstraction level that might be the bytecodes that we saw in Maxime's. Um, Tor might be branch probability, it might even be basic blocks, loop counts, all these kind of things. And of course, on the other hand, the static metrics, numbers of classes, how many um, methods does a class have, how many fields does a class have, and so on and so on. Static instructions makes static types, coupling between classes, anything that kind of would describe something important that may be relevant for optimizing or at least uh, representing the real application's behavior in our um, generated code. So there are various tools out there to collect these metrics. Um, we saw some today, or at least some results. Here, just another one from the RV Fast Yet benchmark paper I have been working on. We can collect these metrics. So I think getting to these metrics is not impossible. Um, same thing for static metrics. Here, just an example for Ruby. Um, I went to GitHub. Um, grabbed 10 projects, the largest projects I could find, and in the end that accumulated to 6 million lines of code, uh, considering all the libraries and whatnot, and I extracted metrics there. So all that is possible, and I think you, you should be able to use that pretty straightforwardly. The problem here is that taking these metrics, especially what we saw before, um, there's correlation between those, um, and uh, we need to be able to handle that. So if you go straight forward and try to take these metrics and generate code, perhaps by simply building a cumulative distribution and then taking kind of a uniform random number to generate perhaps um, the number of methods um, that we want with a specific length. So that's what I did here perhaps. Uh, so I had my corpus, uh, that's the distribution that we have here. So on the x-axis, the number of lines of code and then the number of methods um, wizard lines of code that I found. So for Ruby, you will find quite a few one line methods, uh, but then because you have that start and end, uh, there are quite a number of three line methods as well. And uh, yeah, as Maxime, I think said, uh, there are a lot, a lot of small, really small methods in Ruby. 
So, but uh, with that basic approach, I could generate these kind of uh, synthetic benchmarks. So here, just an example, I get the same distributions basically if I try to generate a random 100 methods or 1,000 methods. The problem here is really that these metrics are independent. And here, um, kind of another graph trying to show that if we look at that. So the idea is here, the blue line represents methods that are one line long. So we have those up here. So most of them have zero. So about 70% uh, have zero arguments. And then a couple have one or two arguments. And then that's basically it. Um, the red line is lines of methods that are 30 lines long and uh, there's about 70 um, and then there are the blue ones or oh, what is the purple um, that are perhaps six to 15 lines and here we actually see that uh, only 50 percent have zero arguments and then uh, overall if you would add all that up the middle range of methods seems to have overall more number of arguments than long methods so we see these kind of strange patterns in real code. So we, there are all these kind of interdependencies and we would need to figure out ways how to kind of replicate that in synthetic code uh, properly. So one way of possibly going about doing that um, that I was thinking of is simply collecting these static and dynamic metrics on a per method basis and then kind of generating for a large code base these kind of method summaries that describe a specific method. And then connecting them, because in the end we need to kind of have a behavior, how do we call methods between classes and other methods and so on. So we need some notion of a call graph as well. So other people came up with the idea of probabilistic call graphs. So you have a certain uh, probability that a certain edge call site goes to another method. So we could kind of collect that and then kind of summarize a code base with these kind of statistics and hopefully then randomly kind of select from that based on the number of occurrence and then generate a benchmark that hopefully um, exhibits the behavior of real applications. So now the question of course is how can we test that we achieved that goal? So Will the resulting benchmark actually behave like a realistic application? And I think there are at least three steps we can do to check that. And that's simply generating the code, making sure that the static metrics are actually similar to the application that we care for. Then looking at, then we actually run the thing. Does the dynamic metrics also behave similarly? And then um, we could look at known application optimization, sorry, not application optimizations, optimizations in all virtual machines by disabling them, whether they have the same effect on the realistic application as on our application that we generated. So that would at least give us an idea of whether the optimizations that we already know would um, behave similarly on the generated code. Well, the problem is that, of course, as we try again to predict the future based by looking at the past. Um, so that may as well go wrong. But um, I suppose the ideal case here is that our synthetic benchmarks are no less predictive and hopefully even a bit more predictive than the benchmark, the synthetic benchmarks or micro benchmarks or whatever we currently use um, to kind of pursue the same kind of research questions. Of course, there are a whole lot of uh, open questions. As I said, uh, we haven't really implemented that far yet. We don't actually have a good characterization of any large application out there yet. But I think uh, we need to also consider things like external libraries, uh, use of operating system, especially when we think about um, dynamic languages. How do we interact with native code libraries, especially when people start building stuff in C for Ruby, for instance. And we probably also need to look at different application styles, batch processing via is a request response like in a web service scenario and so on. So a lot of stuff to do. Um, but I hope that uh, at least the idea here will help us at some point to generate synthetic benchmarks that allows us to investigate cold code performance by using method summaries, perhaps based on static and dynamic metrics combined with some form of probabilistic call graph. And then we can check whether they really 
have the same behavior statically, dynamically, and on known optimizations to validate that the benchmark is something useful. Again, we haven't tried that yet, so still work to be done. So what's needed next? Of course, we want to do that work, but what we really need is also people with real applications out there. So um, perhaps the Shopify people, they have their million slides of Ruby code. What we need is somebody who is willing to give us uh, dynamic metrics and static metrics um, from their actual in-use applications. We are interested in a dynamic language, so dynamic language, Java, that kind of just-in-time compiled system we are interested in. And of course, uh, they would need to, to be happy to share these kind of message summaries, perhaps, if it turns out that's going to be a useful abstraction. All right. Um, yeah, so I hope that that's, that's not too out there and that there is some hope that we can actually study especially the kind of capacity loss that Facebook and others see simply by having to restart every, I don't know, half an hour, hour, because they redeploy the application. I think there's still a lot of work to be done also in academia, and this, at least we academics, I think, could would really benefit from these kind of large, easy to use synthetic benchmarks. All right, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>